And if you're looking for old content, you can visit either aapcb.com slash blog or royalcircuits.com slash blog. With that, let's go ahead and get going with part two of our DFX fundamentals that reduce cost and decrease turn time. We're joined here with Advanced Assembly from Aurora, Colorado. Advanced Assembly builds boards better and faster than anyone else. As we go through this, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. We will not be monitoring chat. It's just too much to keep track of. So again, if you have questions, please ask them as we go along in the Q&A. I'll either field the questions live as we go or we'll hold them for the end and answer them afterwards. Our target time for today's presentation is approximately 45 minutes and uh, we'll see how we do. With that, my name is Mark Hughes and I am part of the team at Advanced Assembly in Aurora, Colorado. And with me today, we've got the wonderful, talented and surprisingly upbeat Chow Vang. Chow, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Chow Vang and I manage the engineering team here at Advanced Assembly. I've been with this company for 11 great years. Um, at Advanced Assembly, we were built specifically to assemble circuit boards really fast. And how my team helps with this process is we review customers' files for any kind of design-related issues that can cause your job to stop out on the manufacturing floor. Um, we do this by working with customers, going over the issues and coming up, in, uh, coming up with resolutions before we release your files out to the production floor. And this is the reason why why we're able to assemble uh, circuit boards so fast in as little as a few days and maybe even a few hours. Yeah, we recently did a, a rush job for uh, a customer. Gosh, um, I, the, the pizza cutter one. How quick did we put that one out? I think we got the boards and parts that same morning and we're able to go ahead and because we were, are right by the airport, go ahead and deliver that same day. Yeah, that was an incredible turnaround time. Uh, the customer contacted us at on Tuesday morning. Um, you know, we had the board being produced later that day, uh, put on a uh, plane, shipped to uh, Advanced Assembly overnight. Advanced Assembly received it, got the parts, assembled it, shipped it back out. Just an incredible turn time. Um, you guys really know what you're doing, and I, I really like working with you. So let's go ahead and go over today's presentation. Last time uh, with Royal Circuit Solutions, we went over DFM. And if you'd like to see that presentation, visit royalcircuits.com forward slash blog. Today, we're going to go over assembly. We'll look at the process overview, talk about some design choices, and look at some common mistakes. And in one or two days, this presentation will be available at aapcb.com forward slash blog. Pardon me. So first, let's take a quick look at the process overview. Uh, assembly side, we're going to put some solder down, place your components, melt the solder, clean your board, and then inspect it. And we'll go in and get going. Chow, would you like to talk about a solder paste application or would you like me to? Um, so for advanced assembly, what makes us unique from other assembly houses is that you have two different types of application to put paste on the boards. Normal process is you use a typical five mil stencils and then you go ahead and squeegee on the paste on. This allows for uneven uh, paste application if the technician is not skilled or they're not trained properly. What we have in our assembly shop is the jet paste printer. So this one here allows the machine to put paste on your board in an even manner. So this also allows us to go ahead and change um, the paste at that particular time. So if there's an issue with the apertures on your stencils, we don't have to order a new stencil and then wait another 24 hours to get those stencils. We can make those modifications on our software and make those paste changes on the fly at that particular moment. And then the paste printer also allows um, optical inspection of the paste application, making sure that everything is deposited in an even uniform manner. So you also have the machine check the paste application for you so you don't get those unevenness of paste um, deposits on the actual PCBs. 
some of the other problems with stencil printings too, uh, you know, you've got issues with release, you've got issues with cleanliness, right? Is the person that is using your stencil, are they cleaning between each panel or are they just kind of going with it? Um, a lot of that can lead to variability in your design. We don't have that problem with the jet, the jet paste printers and man, are these things fast. Um, I, I forget the exact term you might know, Chow, but don't these things pull like three G's when they're uh, with accelerations? Yes, they do. I mean, they're coming in like a B-52 on a bombing run. They're not just going over the part and dropping paste. They're flinging it at it. Um, I mean, the, the people that, that built this, you know, had to basically look at ballistic trajectories to get this stuff to go down. It's fast. It's accurate. It's infinitely adjustable. Um, it, it's just a really great way to go. That was a, uh, oh, I forget what board that was but I found that online. Anything else you want to tell us about the Micronic? Oh, so when you were saying how fast this jet, uh, jet paste printer is, there's mm -hmm. also a, an, a positive side to it going slow as well. So for really dense boards, when the paste printer goes a little bit fast, you can actually slow it down to reduce solder whiskers. So um, we have a customer who has really dense parts that are next to each other. So we found that if we actually slow the machine down, it reduces um, solder whisker and it allows the board to be pasted almost perfectly without any kind of soldering issue. So you have the ability to go fast, but also slow it down depending on the actual design itself. So we have that capability to adjust this machine specifically to your board design. And you prefer a one-to-one -one, uh, paste apertures, don't you? Uh, yes paste to pad aperture and you guys do the adjustments from there, correct? Yes. So if we go ahead and paste the first board and there's issues with the amount of paste being deposited on a certain footprint, we can go in and adjust how much more we want to add or how much we want to take away to make the optimal paste release on that particular footprint that's causing any kind of defects that you would see through like x-ray or AOI inspection. Okay, very cool. So then after we get the solder paste on the board, it's time to put your parts on. And for that, we use a pick and place. Anything you want to tell about this? Yeah, so most um, assembly houses, they don't have this capability. But for us, um, our pick and place machines, we have a tray management system where we can take loose components and they don't have to be in reels or really large cut tapes. We can take your loose components, put it on a tray, put it on our pick and place machine and be able to machine place those couple of parts that you may have laying around that are really expensive. You don't have to buy a hundred of them. So we have that capability to also do that for customers who are just doing small amounts amount of boards with, you know, parts that they already have and they don't have to buy it in reels or really long cut tapes. How many reels can we load at a time? I know it depends on the size of the reel, but like yeah. if I'm a, if I'm an engineer and I don't want to uh, uh, essentially run the cost up by having you guys change out reels during a load, how many different parts can I choose? So it depends on, we have different types of machine out on the floor, but they anywhere range from 15 to 25 different reels at the same time. So what should I, what should my target be uh, as an engineer for parts? I mean, how do I save money? Can I save money by not having too many reels going on at a time? Um, you can, yes, you can save money by not having too many parts. Um, but honestly, with how efficient we are, um, with this, we're able to do 25 to 35 designs throughout the day. So, um, we can actually do them pretty fast, but with our process and everything. Okay. Very cool. All right. So after, uh, after that, You'd have, you've got to melt the solder somehow. And the two common, or the, the probably the most common, I would say, way to do that is with convection reflow. Uh, there are some companies that use IR reflow, um, but there are some issues with that. So, you know, we prefer the convection, a multi-zone convection oven. And we've got, I don't know how many zones, Chow, do you offhand? Four. So four zone. And then we can run your board through with thermocouples and really tune things in too, can't we? Yes. So, I mean, very cool stuff, but the real 
real cool stuff is our vapor phase reflow capability. And I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, anything that you wanna share before I move on to vapor phase? Yeah, so what we actually do as well with the regular convection reflow is if you have a particular design and we also look at the PCBs and the amount of parts that go on there, so we have our regular standard lead free leaded uh, reflow profile that we use, but we can also do custom ones for customers based on um, how thick their boards are and the type of parts, how um, how much thermal uh, copper that are on there that's going to suck up all the heat and everything. And so we can do custom reflow profile for customers as well. That's pretty cool. Um but wait till you hear about vapor phase. Uh, I could do a whole hour on this. So if you've got a pure substance like water or this thing called PFPE that I'm gonna talk about in a moment, it's got very, very predictable uh, heating profiles. You dump in a certain amount of heat and the temperature will change a certain amount, right? Very consistent heat capacity. Now, it does that until you get to a phase change. This is where the molecules are have enough energy that you can break apart these weak intermolecular bonds that hold them together. So if we look over at the, um, the heating curve here for water, you know, when you go from solid to liquid, there's this part where you're dumping, you're dumping heat into it and the temperature doesn't change. It's got effectively an infinite heat capacity. You can dump a ton of heat in, the temperature won't change until those intermolecular bonds are broken and it enters the next phase. You know, so you get liquid, you dump heat in, it's going to change temperature a predictable amount, uh, again, until you get to this next transition. When you go from uh, liquid to vapor, this is when, you know, water would be boiling. The heat capacity is effectively infinite during those transitions, right? It's not practically, it's, it's almost you get a ton of you get a ton of energy that you can get out of these things. Now that is for a pure substance. When you do mixtures, the mixture is going to affect the phases of of things. It's going to affect when it starts to melt, when it finishes melting, um, all this all this great stuff. Well, for solder, and in this case, I'm using a lead solder diagram here. That happens at around uh, sixty percent. 10, 40% lead, if I have this thing labeled correctly. Uh, and what you end up with is this thing called a eutectic point, a well-mixed point. Lead by itself melts at like 320. Tin by itself melts at something like 240. But you mix them together and the, the temperature that these things melt at lowers down to, you know, I think it's like 187 or something around there. You get a lower temperature that you can melt things at. Now that's important because that means that we're exposing your components to a lower temperature. So the trick is then to transition at this temperature and this temperature alone without overheating your components. So here's the trick. You look at the temperature of your solder, whether that's lead or lead free, and you go and you find a chemical that boils just two or three degrees above that. So you can dump effectively an infinite amount of heat into the board if you need to without having a large temperature excursion. Isn't that clever, right? So we use uh, this chemical called a, a PFPE, perfluoropolyether. And this stuff is a, a long chemical and you can select the boiling point by changing the number of these ethers that are on it. Perfluoro basically just means that we replaced the uh, the carbons that would be out here with uh, with fluorine atoms or the uh, I'm sorry was it the hydrogens with fluorine atoms. Anyhow, um, so by selecting different intermolecular uh, weights, you can have different temperatures, and you can keep that at a very 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 specific temperature that is just above the melting temperature. So you can put your board in, and you can dump all the heat you want to into it at once at a very controlled level. So here is just a quick animation. We put these boards in this chamber where we lower them into the vapor, the PFPE vapor. The vapor condenses on the board, heats it up, pull it out. We cool it down and we recover any remaining liquid and we pull it out. I mean, 
I don't know whoever came up with this system, but they need a raise. Chow, was it you? You can be honest. I, I won't tell anyone. Chow? Uh-oh, we've lost Chow. Um, let me ask, can people still hear me? Yes, Mark, I'm here and I can hear you. Okay, so we'll get Chow back on here in a minute. Um, anyhow, thank you for those of you that, that commented. All right, so other ways that we do it, that's basically for our SMT parts um, that we have this capability, but other ways that we do it for through-hole parts are either with our selective solder processes or our wave solder. And essentially what we do here is just take your board and expose it to this solder and it'll just go and suck on and wick into the holes and attach your board. So we've got both of those capabilities. One of the issues with selective solder uh, and wave solder is you can inadvertently dump a ton of heat into your board causing uh, warpage and, and other such things. So that's no good. Then after we clean and assemble everything, we, I'm sorry, after we assemble everything, we clean it. And a lot of times people say, well, can't you just use no clean flux? Yeah, you can. And we use no clean flux. It's, it's, it's great stuff. But the problem is that PCB assembly is a messy process. You've got all sorts of stuff going on. Um, Mike Conrad, whose company makes these machines that we use, says, you know, he's gone into factories and, you know, you start seeing that the reliability of boards dies after break times, you know, after lunchtime. Why? Well, some of the employees are coming back with contaminated hands, contaminated shirts, you know, they've got Dorito breath, whatever. It ends up on the board and it causes these latent failures that they can actually trace back to production times. Um, so regardless of whether or not you use no clean flux, you should always, always clean your board. Um, doesn't really take that long either. It's a pretty cool little system that they have going. A lot of high pressure, a lot of good stuff. After that, we start inspecting your boards. And we've got obviously um, microscopes that we can use, optical inspection, uh, automatic optical inspection. But we also have this cool five axis x-ray. So the five axis basically just means five degrees of freedom, you know, up, down, left, right, in, out, rotate, um, and in one direction and then pitch and yaw this thing over. So we can get these really cool oblique views of your boards. Um, one, of the, one of the problems with, with BGAs is that sometimes you get the hip hop, you know, head and pillow, head on pillow, or you get that the solder wicks down into these holes and that's no good but you cannot see that optically. There's no way to see it optically. So you have to get x-ray inspection and we've got x-ray machine right on site. It's a super cool machine. And we actually just bought another one uh, for another one of our facilities, but it's gonna take a little bit to get that one up and running. The issues that cause this, right? It happens during assembly, but the problem actually began during design, right? This is a DFM error that shows up during assembly. Here you've got a little four, little four connection BGA and the solder has left the pad and wicked into the hole because there wasn't a solder mask that was damming the solder right over here. The designer should have called this one out as a, um, Oh, tinted, uh, tinted via, and they didn't. So the solder wicks away, and now you've got a part that's going to have to be reworked, or, you know, in some cases you have to scrap the board, although with a little four pin, they can easily rework this. So you've got different types of vias. The cheapest is the through hole. The through hole is the one where you often get the biggest wicking problems. Here we've got another one where a designer did a BGA and they didn't want to pay for VIPO, which is understandable. So the solder got into all of the vias. And here, I mean, we're going to probably going to have to scrap that part. Uh, we might have to scrap the board. I, it'll just depend on how big this is. We're only getting a, uh, a small 
cutaway, but it looks like a big thing. But there's nothing we can do on the assembly side to fix this. Now, you're probably saying, you know, we, we, we can't just add more solder. And the answer is no, you can't add more solder. And there's nothing really we can do on any of the other boards in this batch to fix them. I mean, we're going to have to go through and charge you to fill these holes with something. We're going to have to either do an epoxy fill or we're going to have to do um, an LPI fill. But when you do it at this stage, by the time it gets to us, it gets really expensive. I mean, it, you might as well just make a new board. Essentially, it's that expensive to have it reworked on the assembly side. So you don't really want to do that. And I'm going to give you a solution to that in just a second. Same thing with small parts here. Um, we don't catch this during we don't catch this during assembly um, during our DFA. We would catch this during a DFM. Now we can rework this. QA will catch this, and QA can easily touch up this little part. But it's something that you should avoid if you can. Try not to put holes in your pads or holes near your pads. Give at least three mils separation so we can put a little solder dam on there. All right, I think I see Chow back. Sorry, Mark, I was having connection issues here. That's okay, I've got cat issues over here. <laughs> He's crying, so. Hey, so I was just talking um, about this particular issue and how it shows up during the DFM checks and not the DFA checks. You wanna hop in on that? Yes. Yeah, so for the DFA check, we actually don't look at the drill files. That's why we're not able to see the actual drills in the pads. So it is very critical that um, when the DFM is completed and they bring this issue up, you help correct it at that particular time and not just leave the uh, holes open. Make sure it's tented or epoxy filled like Mark was saying. Um, so correct the issues at the fab level. Um, don't let it come to the assembly level because by this particular time, it's going to take us a lot of additional time and rework costs to correct this particular issue when it could have been done on the DFA, uh, DFM side. Yeah. And it's not just, um, it's not just uh, these types of pads. Thermal pads are a huge issue as well. If you've got over 50% voiding on your part, you know, we've got to rework or reject the part and that lowers your yield and costs things. And if you look on this particular design, everywhere they have an open via is the site of some amount of voiding, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you avoid that? How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, the most expensive way that people never want to pay for is epoxy filled and plated, via and pad plated over. It's expensive, people don't wanna do it. A less expensive option is LPI fill, right? We use the same stuff that we're gonna cover your board with, we shove it in the hole. Um, great, except it's expensive. The two free options are tinted and open. Okay, well, we saw the issues with open. Um, tinted, we can tint up to like a 50 mil uh, hole. That's pretty big. And that can keep the solder from going in. So you might be aware, you might not, that IPC 7093 provides solutions for the thermal pad problem. Uh, and it provides some other, other guidance as well. But essentially, other than just letting your voiding be random, they just assume, okay, we're gonna cover 80% of the pad with solder. We're going to not worry about the rest. And they create these solder dams around the vias so that the solder isn't able to wick into the hole. Now, those patterns probably look to you to be a little bit complicated and you might be wondering, well, how do I do this, 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 and this? And my answer to you would be don't. Head over to pcblibraries.com and look at their footprint builder software. I think they've got a new one coming out uh, within a month or two, uh, you know, a significant update. And you can use that to, uh, you can use that to make your footprints for you. You just put in your part number and it spits out a really, really nice footprint, very customizable. It's probably better than anything you're gonna be able to do, um, especially in the amount of time that engineers usually have to do these sort of things. It's always, always on a thing. All right, here is another DFA issue that uh, is really a DFM, you know, something that happens during manufacturing and that is symmetry. Chow, what happens if you've got an un 
unsymmetric, uh, non-symmetric stack up. And while you answer, I'm going to let this cat out. <laughs> you there? I'm here. Okay. Did we, were we able to cover it? Oh, I was waiting for you to let your cat out. Oh, no, I, I meant like, well. <laughs> so with the unbalanced stack up, exactly as your image shows there on the right, you're going to get um, warpage or um, on the PCB. That's how it's going to come out after reflow. And you definitely can't have parts on boards like that. Um, nothing's going to get soldered to it. Yeah. Um, another issue that you guys see all the time, as I understand, is missing pin one indicators. Yeah. Yes, so that is a very common issue that we see. So in this particular image here, um, there's no silkscreen pin one indicator. So even though based on your XYRS, a part will be imported in a certain way, we cannot visually confirm that that is the correct orientation. So um, go ahead and add in the silkscreen indicator on this particular footprint. And then that's how we're gonna orient the component on there. Some customers like to make their pin one pad rounded so it's different than um, every other pad. So however you want to do it, we should be able to differentiate between um, the other pads and your pin one to be able to orient the parts correctly. So this would be one of the issues that we find during the DFA check and bring to your attention for a resolution. What about polarity? Yes, yeah, so this is an example of a speaker component that on the physical part itself, it has a plus N, but there's no indicator on the actual footprint itself of where that plus N should be. And so we would not know how to orient this component without asking the customer to identify the plus N on the footprint. Definitely. Same thing with L LEDs. Uh, polarity is a big problem too, isn't it? Yes, LEDs is one of the biggest problems that we see with rotation, just because a lot of the manufacturer, they're not designing the component with a certain standard. Most of them are, but a lot of them are not. And so the customers, I don't know if they're trying to identify the pin one, they're trying to identify anode or cathode. So it has to be some sort of indicator on the footprint that's clear on how we should orient the LEDs, because if we don't, most likely it's going to be placed incorrectly. So we yeah. have to make sure we have some sort of polarity indicator that tells us 100% that this is how it's supposed to be placed. I've just moved to three pin LEDs. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've given up. Yeah. Yes, it's the more leads you have, the more complicated it is for sure. Yeah. So, all right. What about, uh, what is, first of all, let's talk about what an XYRS and a, a BOM are. The XYRS is your coordinate information for the components on your build. So it's the XY coordinates, the rotation and side information. And then your bomb obviously is your bill of materials. So part of the DFA check that we do is compare both of these files. So the REFDA is found in one file and then not the other and vice versa. So in this particular example, the first set that you see here with L4 and L5, those are components that are missing from the XYRS file, but they were found in your BOM. The resolution to this particular issue is for you to supply us with the XYRS data for these two components in order for us to be able to place it in the right location on the board. Um, the next issue you see here is the opposite, where the parts were found in the XYRS, but they were missing in your bomb. So the resolution here is you can say, I really don't want C25, C26 place, so go ahead and DNI it. Or you can provide me the bomb information to go ahead and have us place C25 and C26. All right. Um, another issue that you have are duplicate reference designators. Now, I created this problem recently uh, when we were making panels for the Teach Me PCB course. And, you know, everybody had, basically we had, I don't know, 20 different designs on a panel and everybody was using the exact same reference designators on their little part of the board. But advanced assembly just got one big panel. So to them, it looks like one big PCB. 
right? It's just one big board, except now you've got, you know, 20 spots on it with identical reference designators. And what does that do to you guys? You, you can't do anything with that, can you? We can't. So at this particular time, you will have, um, you know, 20 L4s and then 20 locations on the XYS for L4. So the program doesn't know that this L4 goes in this top pan, uh, this top board over here. So you have to differentiate between these ref desks by assigning it, making it different the, than the other L4. And a good way to do that, sometimes what I would suggest to a customer is using letters at the end. So you have L4A, L4B, L4C. So even though they're all L4s, um, the last letter makes them different and that they belong in a different location on the board itself. So yeah. do, not, do not have repeated rough dads. That causes a lot of problems. And this isn't going to show up on your silk screen, right? This is your assembly, um, your assembly layer. This, your silk screen is still going to say, you know, R1, R2, R3. It's the um, XYRS and the bomb that are going to say uh, R1A, R1B, R1C. That's correct. Yeah. So your silk screen is going to show all the same rough desk, the 20 same rough desk, but it's the data inside the bomb and the XYS that are going to be different and that are going to match. Cool. Um, we did have, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, since we've passed those slides, I'm going to wait to come back to them, but I see them and we will definitely answer those. Those are good questions. All right. Um, part value mismatches. How, how do you catch those? I know how they happen. I, I, I do it all the time, but um, how do you catch them? So in the DFA check, we actually go line by line and look up the part number that you're calling out. And we're comparing the manufacturer's description of that part number to your description found in your bomb. And so in this particular case, the first example, based on that part number, it's it should be 120 ohms, but your bomb it says it should be 8.2 K. So this is a, a discrepancy that will bring up to your attention. And you can say that is the right part number. Go ahead and change my value to the 120 ohm. Or you can say, I really intended to use the 8.2 K. Here's a new part number that matches. So these, we go line by line, make sure that we're checking values so that we don't accidentally um, populate a part that you did not intend to put on that location. And I appreciate it every time you catch one of those mistakes. Um, so as a designer, it, it comes in, at least for me, it comes from laziness. Um, instead of going and making a brand new part, I'll just copy and paste an old one. And sometimes I won't change the, uh, the values. You know, I'll, I'll, a moment of distraction is all it takes to cause, you know, hours of headaches uh, when you're designing a board. And it, man, I've done that a lot, too many times. All right, here's another sticking point for you, right? Footprint land patterns don't match. And yeah, that has a lot to do with the Imperial and metric system. The information that you actually see on like, let's say DigiKey's website, you really want to put a, a 0603 part on there and show, and it's, you're seeing 1600, Eight, which is actually 1.6 millimeter by 0.8 millimeter. So a lot of these have the same values on both columns. So it may be confused like an 0201, you may think it's an 0603, but it's really a 0.6 millimeter by 0.3 millimeter. So that's where the confusion comes in to sometimes where the customers think they're actually selecting a package for that particular footprint, but they're really not selecting that right package. So it just depends on which um, type of measurements you're using. And I don't know what criminal mastermind came up with that numbering system, um, but man, that has caught me a time or two as well. Um, I, I think it's probably caught most engineers a time or two. That so we'll we'll go ahead and uh, when we see these type of discrepancies, we'll bring it to your attention, and you can just give us a part number for the component that actually fits the footprint. All right, all right. Let's hit some questions and. Um, answer them as we go. We're doing great on time. So we've got time for all of these. First one is a statement and then a question. I have often asked my sales representative for a report card, which basically summarizes any information that could have been improved upon to make further production orders go smoother and have better yields. Is this a common industry practice and request? 
Uh, if there are issues with production, I would definitely like to know about them rather than text on the rework floor, just fix them and not inform the engineer. Thanks. So uh, are you aware of what we provide back at the end or is that more a QA question? No, so for us, if it doesn't pass, so we're all IPC trained here. So if it doesn't pass IPC standard class two, those are the issues that will bring to your attention and get your resolution and then release it to the floor. But if it passes IPC class two, then those are things that we'll go ahead and um, FYI to the production floor, but we're gonna go ahead and build it because it does pass IPC class two. And so um, there are instances where we can't catch the issue at the DFA level, but they caught it out on the floor. We can't just go ahead and place it. Most of the times we'll have to go and FYI the customer on things that we make the decision to go ahead and proceed with. So if it's any kind of issues, we'll always FYI the customer if we decide to proceed with. If it's something, like I said, that doesn't pass IPC class two while it's out on the floor, we'll definitely contact the customer for their um, answers or resolution on how to proceed seed. All right. Very cool. So yeah, there is a lot of communication, a lot of emails going back and forth. Um, your project will sometimes be put on hold while we're waiting to get those things answered. Um, hopefully not for too long because that'll slow things down, but we want to make sure that we give you a board that you are happy with. And if that means waiting an hour, we're going to wait an hour. So thanks for that question. And, and keep asking them, we've got uh, two open right now at the moment. Um, just to clarify on thermal pads for components which have vias, can non-conductive fill be used and paste applied on top of it or must it be VIPO? Um, you really don't wanna put paste on top of LPI. LPI repels um, the, the liquid solder. It, it's gonna cause it to flow somewhere. So if you did anything, you would want to, um, do a via tint and then put the paste around the tint, right? The, the tinting would, would act as a, a, a repellent for it. Um, filling it is even better, but you still are gonna have some amount of a via tint that you're gonna, you're gonna put there. The, the trouble with the LPI fill is that, you know, you still can get a little bit of outgassing um, and there's no place for that air to go unless you give it some, some channels in there. Um, I'd be happy to, if you wanna shoot me an email at uh, mhughes at aapcb.com. We've got some presentations just on this particular question and I can jump, um, I can jump into it uh, a little more clearly there. Um, so the question is, tinting a via still leaves a hole, right? Would this be an issue for corrosion? Uh, yeah, there's still gonna be a barrel hole in there. Uh, tinting certainly helps with that, but you're right that you can still get some, some moisture to migrate in there. And if, if there is other stuff in that via hole that you know we're trapping in with the tinting, it could certainly cause corrosion. Um, Vipo is, if you have a high reliability application, something that's going into space, uh, something that's going down hole, uh, maybe even some automobile stuff, you're probably gonna wanna pay for the Vipo. Um, but if not, check out that uh, standard that I showed you and pcblibraries.com can make those patterns for you. It's economical, it works. Um, it, I mean, it's free, it adds nothing to your production costs. So for the rest of us, for those of us who aren't building uh, aerospace products, we can, get a, we can get away with it just fine. Excuse me for a moment. <coughs> All right. Um, Chow, we've got the question. What are the critical parameters that you expect to be on the bomb? Uh, manufacturing part numbers. What, what do we definitely need on the BOM? Minimum information on a bill of materials would definitely be the reference designator, um, manufacturer's part number, value and package size, and also your DNI information. So those are the minimum information that we would like to have in your bill of materials. Okay, and could we get that one more time, please? Yes, so REFDES, manufacturer's part number, value, package size, and DNI information. And what does DNI mean again? Do not install. So okay. parts that you do not want installed on your PCB. All right, and I sometimes use DNP for do not populate, and I assume you guys 
are familiar with that a little bit as well? Yes. Yeah, so DNP sometimes causes confusion because I know some customers also use DNP for um, or do for other things um, like do not stuff, do, do not populate. Sometimes they go do not buy. Um, so DNI is the preferred information to put in there, but we'll always ask if there's some sort of confusion. Okay, good to know. Um, question is, when the project's on hold, are the boards removed from the assembly line until resolution or the assembly sits on the machines resulting in an unusable assembly line until resolution? So we evaluate, yes. Yeah, so when it goes on hold, it literally holds up the machine. And so what we try to do is if it's something that's on the machine, it actually gets top priority because we're trying to get it moved along on the production floor. And so the hold will go in, Some someone will very, uh, contact engineering, engineer will pick up the phone and call the customer to try to get the resolution as soon as possible. If it gets past 30 minutes to an hour and they're it's looking like we can't get a hold of the customer they'll take it off the machine and you don't want that to happen because there's a lot of attrition that happens and so you may lose parts in that process and so we advise the customer to give us you know all sorts of different types of um, contact information um, your multiple email addresses multiple phone numbers multiple contacts that way we can get the job moving along out on the floor without holding up the machine where we have to take it off the machine. And we do just about everything we can to make sure that we don't get holes on the machine, right? We that. try to find everything before it ever hits the production floor. Yes. All right. Thank you for that one. And uh, again, please feel free to keep asking questions down in the Q&A box. Um, do we use flying probes for testing shorts and open on VCB, I think he means PCB. Do we use flying probe tests? So I, I would answer that um, we do, but the time that you really want the flying probe is in the manufacturer. Before any parts are put on a, a, a board, you want to know if that board's known good. So for those of you that aren't familiar, flying probe has um, these little spring-loaded probes that move super fast and they check each net for connectivity and for short circuit with other nets. Um, it's something that would take impossibly long to do by hand. And these probes, you know, move so fast. I mean, you can, you can barely see them. You can barely keep track. Um, after your board's assembled, the typical way that you test the board at that point is with a bed of nails uh, rather than a flying probe test. You'll, you'll have test points that come down and contact the thing. Uh, you can program it, you can debug it, uh, you know, use JTAG for some boundary scan uh, information, but flying probe is usually before parts are put on, sometime uh, at the end of manufacture before your first part is placed. Chow, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, you you said it all. I'm sorry, I should have shared. It's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, do we have any other open questions that you guys would like to ask? We're happy to we're happy to answer them while you're here. It's very very quiet. I see. Uh, I see we've got quite a few uh, customers that are on right now. So I really do hope that you guys have enjoyed this. Please remember that we do free webinars. Uh, we can do it on any topic of your choice. And it's free. It's a value add for our customers, just like our, all our engineering services are. You just contact your salesperson, say, I want to learn more about X. And we will sit there with you and prepare slides. We can bring in our engineers, have a round table. We can make this look whatever you need it to look like. All right, we're still waiting for additional questions if anybody has any. Jackson, help me out here, buddy. You got a question for me? Oh, okay, somebody said, where has the popcorn gone? Um, I don't know where your popcorn has gone, Kevin. Maybe into your belly? I'm not sure. Um, I hope you find your popcorn. Um, I do. That's, that's, that's got to be traumatic. All right, here's a question. I've got multiple boards made from you guys with test points. Some of the boards have test points with paste on them, and some don't, but this 
same footprint was used. Why is that the case? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have Chow answer this, but before she does, I'm gonna guess guess there was an issue with your uh, with your pace layer, but I don't know. Chow. So how that um, works is our particular program. It's it's based on your design as well. So we have this software for the pace printers. If it's a large design and we go and create the actual file to be used on the pace printer. And it's not something that we can go in and manually select each individual pad. So there's an option on there to go ahead and select all open pace apertures. So Mark is right. So if you have pace on those test point locations um, and we select that function to select all of the pads to have pace applied, that's where it's gonna put pace on those open locations without parts. Um, if you don't want pace on your open pads without components, that is something that we'll need to know ahead of time. And then we can put that information in your build notes and then nobody can click on that particular function or will not click on that function to have pace applied. And so it's just the engineer who's creating that pace file. They have the option of selecting all of the open apertures on your pace file. So if you have pace in those locations um, and we click that function, it's going to get pasted. Um, and so it just depends on the actual board itself. It's a, if it's a small design, if I was doing it and I looked and all the components that are supposed to be populated, um, they're all pre-selected. I don't have to click on that function to select all open aperture. So it just really depends on the design and the actual engineers doing it. So if you don't want pace on those locations, um, just put that on your assembly drawing or let your sales rep know. Um, that information will make it over to us and we'll make sure that pace does not get in those locations. Speaking of which, uh, we had a question earlier. What's the best way to get information to you? Uh, do I need to put in a text file, a PDF, uh, put in a, an extra layer in my drawing? So I would prefer any assembly information to be outside of the Gerber. So never incorporate assembly information inside of um, different Gerber layers because the only Gerber layers we're looking at are the copper, paste, and silk screen. And so if you're putting it into a mechanical layer or any other um, layer, we're not going to be able to see it. So any assembly information, put it in a PDF, text form, any other files outside of the Gerber layers. All right, uh, we'll do a last call for questions and we are at 11.45 or 11.47. We're two minutes over our target time, but I think we did pretty well. All right, well, with that, I would like to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, hopefully you found it valuable. And remember, this is the second half of a really a 90 minute presentation. The other half of the presentation is available at royalcircuits.com forward slash blog. And you have one day left to get your custom, um, your, your custom Christmas tree ornament. And we do have one last question as we go out. It says, who is best suited for creating a panel of PCBs, the customer or the, uh, the assembler? Uh, assembler. Let, right, let us do your panels for you. We do it all day, every day. Um, and if we make mistakes, it's our problem to fix them. Uh, if you make mistakes, we can bill you for another, another panel. All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful day and we'll wonderful holiday season. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa and any others that are out there and a happy new year. We'll see you in the new year with some new presentations, uh, some new webinars. Let us know what you want. We make these for you. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Take care.